Good morning, everybody. If you'd like to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Psalms. And I'd like to turn to the psalm that we had at the beginning of the service and which has been referenced in our readings. That's Psalm 8. Psalm 8. We're going to look at this this morning. The words on the screen behind you. Let's just read it together. O oh Lord, our Lord. Actually, I was going to read it on my own, so I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I said that. I'll read it, you can listen, all right? <laughs> oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens... The work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Right then. If I open this, what do you think I find inside? Digestive? Digestive, right? Okay, thank you very much. One here for the ladies to make the ladies swoon. I know what pleases ladies. If you open this, what do you think you find inside? Why? Because it says so on the wrapper. Good. Not going too deep for you this morning, are we? No. I don't know if you actually noticed in uh, the reading that we had of that psalm, but there is a wrapper, kind of a wrapper enclosing the psalm that we get in verse 1. And verse 9. Now, the, the technical name for it is an inclusio, but we'll stick with wrapper for now, if that's all right with you. What is it that is in the wrapper? Well, we have these words. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It starts and ends with these words, like a kind of a wrapper, the psalm. And it's, if you like, it lets us know something of the contents of the psalm, what it's about. And the package in the psalm, uh, uh, and by the package in the psalm within these kind of wrappers, David, what he's trying to do is trying to stir you and me to see the majesty of God. And he's trying to incite us, if you like, to praise him. For while this is an individual psalm of David, You'll notice that the heading, if you look in your Bibles, is addressed to the director of music, or maybe we might say the worship leader. And in this particular rapper, it says, Oh Lord, our Lord. So it's a psalm that is uh, to be used in the public worship of God's people, so that together we might come to uh, know and to understand more of this great God that we worship and the way that he works and so to praise him for his majesty. So the first thing we need to do is kind of grasp what it says in this wrapper in verse 1 and verse 9. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, I suppose when we say that in English it kind of sounds a little bit awkward, doesn't it? O Lord, our Lord. But you'll notice if you look in your Bible, and you can see it there on the screen behind you, you'll notice that if you look in your Bible that the first Lord is in capital letters, all capital letters. While the second Lord, you've got a capital L and then just a small O-R-D. That's because the first Lord 
is the personal name of God in the scriptures. And the second Lord is a kind of a title, if you like, meaning king or master. Um, I don't know, if I wanted, perhaps can help to understand, if I wanted to pay my Sarah a compliment along the lines of this psalm, I might say something like, Oh Sarah, my wife, how beautiful is your face in all the earth. And I say that every day to her. No, I don't. I should do, but I should. I don't. Now, but did you notice how I start that off? Oh, Sarah, my wife. First her personal name, then a kind of a title. Same thing here in this wrapper in verse 1 and verse 9. The first Lord is the personal name of God, which we would say perhaps Yahweh, oh Yahweh. And the second Lord is a title. So, oh Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, I think I've mentioned to you before, and it bears repeating, that when you see Lord in capital letters, it's the personal name of God. And although we uh, see it used through the book of Genesis, the first real revelation to do with the name is in the book of Exodus, chapter 3. And I don't know if you remember when Moses, he goes to the burning bush, and uh, God tells him to go and uh, set uh, his people free from Egypt. And Moses asks God, he says, well, what's your name? Well, who shall I tell him, you know, who shall I say the Israelites sent me? Now, when he's saying that, he's not just looking for a bit of information, like, oh, my name's Steve. Oh, cheers, Steve. It's not that kind of thing. A name reveals the character of the person. So he's saying, what are you like? By asking his name, he's saying, what are you like? And God says that his name, and the way that our Bibles usually translate it, is I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. Now, we're fairly sure that that's kind of pronounced Yahweh, something like that, not Jehovah, there's no J sound in the Hebrew language, and it means, along the lines of, the one who is forever existent, the one who exists forever and ever. But it also means more than that, because it's actually drawn from the Hebrew verb to be. So it's not just something existing, but it's about something becoming present. Now, Elaine knows that I exist. Oh, but she knows that I exist now when I come very close and present, doesn't she? Do you see how, how that kind of relates? And in the same way... That's uh, going to set her back a few, a few hours, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> in the same way, that's the same thing. It, it not only means this name of God, one who exists, but one who becomes present, one who draws close... So that, that that person, that existence, is encountered, if you like, in a real and a personal way. So if we look at this wrapper on the outside of this psalm in verses 1 and 9, it's, what it's saying is, O Yahweh, which is his name, O the forever existing one, who the one who becomes present, the one who draws close. O Yahweh, our Lord, our Master, our King, how majestic, how awesome, how amazing, how praiseworthy is your name in all the earth. Now that's what he's trying to do. On this wrapper of the psalm, David is trying to stir us, to motivate us. He's like saying, come on people of God, let's get together and praise the name of our God. Let's praise Yahweh, for he is our God. So, that's what's on, if you like, the wrapper on the outside of the psalm. And inside the wrapper, if we look at the verses around, we're told something about uh, what we can praise this amazing God for, some of the things. So we're going to have a quick look and, uh, at the three things that uh, are encased in this psalm. So the first thing that we're told we can praise God for is the irony of God's strength. The irony of God's strength. Now that's not something you'd normally think of, but let's just have a look at what he actually says there. In verse 1, rest of verse 1, he says, You've set your glory above the heavens from the lips of children and infants. You have ordained strength. I know some of the NIVs say praise, but the actual word is strength. Because of your enemies, to silence the foe and the avengers. Now do you notice in that verse there, you've got two contrasting groups of people that kind of... Uh, shows something of the kind of irony of how Yahweh's strength is displayed. Now, you know what I mean by irony, don't you? You know what I mean by irony? It's like, you know, the Titanic, they said, you know, this ship is unsinkable. 
not even God could sink this ship. And what happened on its maiden voyage? It sank, quite ironic. Or maybe irony or something, I don't know, uh, a, a plumber. And you go to a plumber's house and the plumber's got leaky taps. You know, that's a bit ironic, isn't it? Like, you know, I don't know what else. Um, maybe something like, so ironic would be like, Donny supporting the English football team. <laughs> now, do you think, I mean, that's quite ironic. Would, would that ever happen, Donald? No, absolutely not, no. So, irony, we've got this kind of irony here that's happening here. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, we can see the fact that although Yahweh's glory and splendor in this psalm is said to be above the highest heaven, it says he's actually established or ordained strength from the mouth of infants and children in order to silence the foe and the avenger. So we've got these two groups of people here. It mentions God's enemies, his foes. You might imagine these great big tattooed hairy beasts, you know, the enemies of God that comes against them. But do you notice who it is that God sets against them? Little children, infants, babies if you like. What could be smaller what could be weaker than a little child? And it's amazing, isn't it? It's showing us that God takes and uses the weaker things to accomplish his purpose. You know, think about it. God could wipe out his enemies with just a single thought, but he chooses to come against them through what is weak. It's the irony of God's strength. And it's something that we're to praise him for. Now just think for a moment how that pans out through the scriptures, how God has used particular people. We mentioned Moses just now. Imagine he comes, doesn't he, to, uh, to the bush and uh, God says, I'm going to send you to this king, to Pharaoh. I'm going to send you to this great superpower to set my people free. And you're going to be my spokesperson. And Moses starts, what? what? You know, but I, I can't talk. I, I'm not very good with words. You can imagine him like... Struggling to get my words out, you know. Maybe he stuttered a little bit and he said, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. And yet God sent him in that weakness and worked through him to bring a great deliverance. Let's jump off uh, another couple of books in the Bible. What about the book of Judges? What about Gideon? You know, he's threshing in the floor in the wine press and the angel of the Lord turns up and says, Hi. That's not an exact translation of the Hebrew, but <laughs> Hi, Gideon, mighty warrior. And what does Gideon say? Me? Mighty warrior? No, no, I'm sorry, you've got it all wrong. I'm the weakest and I'm the smallest in my clan. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I think, I think you've got it wrong. It's not me. And yet God uses him to bring a great deliverance for the nation. What about, jump a bit further along, what about in the prophets? What about young Jeremiah, called by God as a youth? As a young man. And God says to this young prophet, you're going to speak words that are going to change the destinies of nations. Maybe what was going through Jeremiah's mind? What, me? Me, a youth? I haven't grown a beard yet. I've still got spots. I'm just a teenager. And yet God used him. And through his words, the destinies of nations were changed. God seems to delight in taking what is weak and using it to display his strength. Do you see the irony of God's strength? Can you believe that we're coming towards Christmas? It's nearly here, isn't it? It's not far away. What do we remember at Christmas? What did God send in order to defeat his enemies? A baby. Can you get your noggins around that? You sent a baby. A baby who grew up and then, as we've been reminded this morning, as we take communion, was crucified in weakness on a cross, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet through that weakness, God defeats and shuts the mouth of the enemies. Think about us for a moment. Think about 
I'll think about us all here gathered this morning, all the different places and situations we come from. Funny little us with all the things that are wrong with us, the sin that there is in our lives, the times that we mess up and that we're still not the people that we want to be, never mind that we think God might want us to be. Do you think God might want to use us? Oh no, we might say, you know, not me, I get things wrong, you know, not until I've sorted my life out and I've crossed every T and dotted every I. But you know, God loves to use weak things and weak people to display his strength. It's a peculiar mark of his majesty. Turn to the person next to you and say, it's a peculiar mark of his majesty. <laughs> he loves, he loves it. He loves to use weak, ordinary people like me and you. He loves to use what is weak to display his strength. You see, the only qualification that you need to be used by God is that you're weak and you come to him and you say, Lord, through my weakness, will you display your strength? What was it Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1? He talked about the foolishness of God being wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God stronger than man's strength. God is a God who can take the weak things and through them display his strength. Now, some of you might have noticed in the NIV that, that they substitute the word uh, strength with the word praise there. Uh, the Hebrew word is actually the word strength, but what the NIV, or at least some of the NIVs, are trying to do is trying to interpret and help you to understand. Because he's saying, what is it? What is it, this strength that comes forth from the mouth of children and infants? What is this strength? Well, it's praise. Now, do you remember the reading that Sandra brought to us earlier from Matthew's Gospel? Do you remember the children, they were praising Jesus and they were saying Hosanna to the son of David and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They were indignant. And do you remember what Jesus said to them? He quoted this psalm. Do you remember what he said? He quoted the psalm out. He said, have you not read from the mouths of infants and children? God has ordained praise. And what he's doing, he, he's not only taking the praise that should ordinarily be only given to God, showing them who he was, but he's also taking uh, these chief priests and rulers and casting them in the light of God's enemies. And he uses the praise of these children to shut their mouths. You see, there is a lethal punch, if you like, in the praise of weak people and it has an effect on the enemies of God and I want to remind you you know there's going to be times in your life when you feel like everything's falling apart you're going to have times in your life when you feel like you're weak when you're insignificant and you just can't get it together there are going to be times when the enemy of God is going to come and try and devour oppress and crush you but God has ordained strength through weak little mouths like ours. And that strength is praise, to shut the mouth and to silence the enemy. It's the irony of God's strength. So, in light of this, in light of the irony of God's strength, what do you think we ought to do? Well, David's already told us on the wrapper, hasn't he? Oh, Lord. Our Lord, how majestic, how amazing, how praiseworthy is your name in all the earth. We're going to look at something else now. Secondly, David shows us that Yahweh is to be praised for the mystery of his loving care. Look at what it says here in verses 3 and 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him? the Son of Man, that you care for him. Now, if it's all right with you, I just want to take a little bit of time out now to make you feel small. Is that all right? Yeah? Right. Well, some of you, yeah, that's true. Well, let me make you feel a little bit smaller, okay? Did you know, I'm going to do a bit of cosmology, I think, with you, a bit of cosmology. Now, I don't know if you know that light travels... At just a little bit over 186,000 miles in a second. So between that and the time between the two claps of my hand, light has travelled 186,000 miles. That's pretty quick, that is, isn't it? It's pretty quick. Now, I want to tell you now, hold that in your mind, that our solar system 
with the sun and all the planets and everything like that, for light to travel across our solar system would take, travelling at 186,000 miles every second, would still take a little bit under two years to get across our solar system. So how vast is that? Now that's our solar system. Starting to feel a little bit small now? See if I can make it feel a little bit smaller. Our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy, right? How big is the Milky Way galaxy in comparison to our vast solar system? Well, if you just for a moment imagine that the Milky Way galaxy was the same size as the continent of North America. Okay, so just picture North America in your mind. Now, if that was the Milky Way galaxy, in comparison to that, our solar system, in comparison to North America, would be the size of a coffee cup. The size of a coffee cup. Amazing, isn't it? Does your head in. Do you feel a little bit small now? Let me see if I can make you feel a little bit smaller. The Milky Way galaxy, as vast as that is, is one of round about 100,000 billion galaxies within our universe. Have you got the idea of how amazingly vast it all is? Have you got the idea of just how small we are? It's crazy, isn't it? And when you consider that, that God made all this without even breaking into a sweat, that he just spoke and it all came into being. And that he not only did that, not only brought it all into being, but he, but he holds it all together moment by moment. When you consider all this, all that he has made, all that he set in place, what is man, says David? What is man that you're mindful of him, that you care for him? Kind of does your head in, doesn't it? The same God who made all of this and holds it together is the same God who loves and cares for you personally. It blows David's mind. It gives him worshipful goosebumps. And it should us as well. What was it David said in another Psalm 139? How precious are your thoughts towards me, O God. How vast the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of the sand on the seashore. This vast, amazing God who is beyond our understanding, who brought all this into being, all the universe, is the same God who cares for little old me and insignificant you. I hope you can get your noggins around this, for if this God who did all this loves and cares for us, there's no need for any lack of self-worth. This vast God loves and cares about you. He thinks about you. He's mindful of you. How humbling is that, that God should stoop down and lovingly care for me and for you. I read a lovely story this week about the composer Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and I heard that he was uh, accosted by a be beggar asking him for money as he walked through the streets of Vienna. Well, Mozart didn't have any kind of money on him at that moment, so he decided, he, he said to the beggar to follow him, and he brought him to a little coffee shop, whereupon Mozart sat down, very quickly composed an entire minuet and trio, uh, gave it to the beggar with a letter and sent him off to his publishers. So off went the beggar to the publishers, and soon... As a result of giving this over, he was handed the princely sum of five guineas, which was a massive amount for a beggar back then. Amazing. But why? Why would he do that? Why didn't Mozart just give this beggar the brush off? Why, didn't, you know, why did he bother with him? Why should Mozart care? Why bother in investing all the time and effort to sit down and do that? Now, expand and blow that up a billion times. What is man, says the psalmist? What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? 
It's the mystery of God's loving care. You see, David, he's not really asking a question here. He's not saying, oh, what is man that you're mindful? He's not thinking like that. He's not so much asking a question. He's making an exclamation. He's not posing some kind of mental teaser. He's engaging in breathless worship. He's saying, what a God. What a God. It's the mystery of his loving care. So what do you think we ought to do in light of that? In light of being reminded of the mystery of God's loving care. Let me just remind you. Because it tells you on the wrapper, doesn't it? Oh Lord! Our Lord! How majestic, how awesome, how praiseworthy is your name in all the earth. And finally... As well as praising God for the irony of his strength and the mystery of his loving care, David wants to stir us in praise to God for the wonder of his awesome plan. To celebrate, if you like, humanity's privileged place within the created order. You see, this vast awesome God who is mindful of us and lovingly cares for us has planned and decreed that little, small, insignificant human beings like you and I should rule as his vice regents on the earth. We see that laid out in verses 5 to 8. It says this, You've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, beasts of the field, the birds in the air, the fish of the sea, and all that swim in the paths of the sea. So then... How does the psalmist know? How does he know that human beings matter to God and that they have a special place in God's awesome plan? He knows because he's read his Bible. You see, verses 5 to 8 that we've got up there on the bottom of the screen, they're just a kind of poetic summary of the Genesis reading that we had earlier where we were told that we are made in the image of God and we're called to rule over God's creation. We are, if you like, royalty. Turn to the person next to you and say, Good morning, Your Highness. <laughs> we're royalty. We're called to rule over God's creation, reflecting his majesty and his glory and his beauty into creation. Now, there may be some of you that sat there thinking, well, that's all very well and all very nice, but hang on a minute. It doesn't very much look like we're doing a good job, does it? It doesn't very much look like we're ruling in majesty, reflecting God's glory over creation. Perhaps you're saying, I don't really feel like royalty. If you see what's happening in my life at the moment, is everything under our feet really? Rather than humanity ruling and expressing the glory of God, you know, quite often it feels like sin is ruling. Quite often it feels like death is ruling. As we see loved ones die and depart. Sometimes if we look around it maybe feels a bit more like cancer is ruling. Or sickness is ruling. Or tragedies or earthquakes or tsunamis or tyrants are ruling. This psalm says that God has placed everything under humanity's feet. But we don't see it, it seems, do we? We don't see everything subject to us in the way that it should be. You know, this is a problem too for the writer of the letter to the book of, he uh, the book of Hebrews. And he wrote about it in the reading that Sandra brought to us earlier too. Do you remember what he said? He said, at present we don't see everything subject to them. That is... To humanity. But, he said, we see who? Jesus. We see Jesus. You see, his argument in the letter is this. No, we don't see God's awesome plan worked out yet in its fullness and all its living colour as it were. Because our fall into sin has, has messed things up. But we do see one man, we do see Jesus. And because of his suffering and death, exhausting the power of sin... He's been raised and he's now crowned with glory and honour and he's reigning now over all the created order. Remind you of what Paul says in Ephesians 1.22. He says this, God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything. Now, did you notice the allusion to Psalm 8 there? All things 
under his feet. What he's saying, in other words, is Jesus in this new humanity is now the one who fulfills Psalm 8. And if we're in Christ Jesus, he will bring all those who are in him to share in that same rule and reign. No, our humanity at present doesn't yet enjoy the, ma- uh, the destiny that's mapped out here in Psalm 8, but there is a man who does, and his name is Jesus. You know, during the late Middle Ages, it was about the end of the 1400s, the talk of Europe, uh, and to do with travel, was, is there a way to get to the nation of India by sea? Now, can we get to India by sea? Because it's a long trip all through the land. And uh, many have tried to sail down underneath the southern tip uh, of Africa. And it was a really bad weather place. You know, it was really difficult. No one had actually made it through. And it ended up being called the Cape of Storms, southern tip of Africa. So it seemed it wasn't possible then to get to India by sea. But there was this Portuguese sailor a man called Vasco da Gama. Now, he was determined to try and make it through around the southern tip of Africa and up to India. And he managed to do it, and uh, he he got all the way round. He went to uh, India, and then he sailed all the way back around the southern tip and came back back in triumph to Lisbon. And uh, as a result, I don't know if you know, the, the cape at the bottom was changed to be called the Cape of Good Hope. Good Hope. And that's where it kind of comes from. But uh, he told them about it. And now, of course, the way to India was open because somebody knew, somebody had been there, somebody had come back and told them about the way through. And that's really what Hebrews 2 is saying. He's saying that the awesome plan of God in Psalm 8, it's not just some pipe dream that we think, oh, wouldn't that be lovely? We may not see it yet in its fullness, but we do see Jesus, the one man who has gone through death, been raised in resurrection life, and now is the first fruits, the pioneer of a whole new humanity. And all those who by faith are connected to him will one day see this plan of God's being lived out on the earth, that all things will be subject to humanity. The question is this morning, are you connected to him? See, this is not just some kind of hope that, oh, it might turn all right out in the end kind of thing. Our hope, we've talked about hope in recent weeks, our hope is in Christ Jesus, the one who has gone there, like that sailor that sailed all the way. Somebody's been there and he's told us. And if you're in him, then what Psalm 8 lies out is one day going to be true for us. What an amazing future. So, you know, in light of this, What do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? In light of the irony of God's strength, the psalmist talks about, in light of the mystery of God's loving care, in light of the wonder of his awesome plan, what do you think we should do? Let me just remind you what it says on the wrapper. Oh, Lord. Oh, Yahweh. Our Lord. How majestic. How awesome, how fantastic, how praiseworthy is your name in all the earth. Church, there's a lot there that you can meditate on and think through during the course of this week. Praising him and blessing him. And we're going to do now what the psalmist tells us in the wrapper. We're going to finish by praising the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. I invite the band to come back and invite you to stand. (laughs) Wherever that is.
to Calvary with Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree body bound and dressed in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone the is still and all alone the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name forevermore for endless days we will sing your praise oh Lord oh Lord our God and his love to be a blessing to others and may you shine for him too in whatever situation you find yourselves so go may the grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord
Amen. Amen. God bless you all. There is tea and coffee, I think, and uh, time has gone, I know. And uh, have a good week.